the meeting of the Standing Committee on Social Development. My name is Nomonde Jamze, the Procedural Officer for Standing Committee on Social Development. Uh, the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Social Development, Member Plato, has tendered an apology for this meeting. Uh, therefore, the committee members will have to elect a chairperson um, uh, among the members. Um, um, the committee needs to elect an an, an acting chairperson for this meeting in accordance with standing rule 82.3, which states in the absence of the chairperson from a meeting, the committee must elect one of its members to, to be acting chairperson at that particular meeting. I now take nominations, members. Yes, Member Fry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, I'd like to wish to nominate Member Bosman to be the acting chairperson for this meeting. Thank you. Member, are there any further nominations, members? Okay, seconded. Member Bosman, you are duly elected <laughs> as an acting chairperson for this meeting. You can take it. Yeah. Yeah. It's very unfortunate. <laughs> it's the very same committee that fired me a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, members, and good morning, colleagues. Um, welcome to this uh, Standing Committee meeting on social development. A very warm welcome to our guests, as well as to the Minister of Social Development, as well as our HOD. It's certainly very nice to be back in committee room one. We haven't been here uh, pre-COVID. I think the last time we were in this committee meeting was a discussion on the Children's Commissioner, the appointment of the Children's Commissioner. Um, colleagues, we are today um, going to be briefed by the Institute for Contemporary Research in Africa on their programs and their role that they play in assisting old age homes that are struggling to operate in the province. So just in the interest of time and efficiency, I'm going to ask that the members please um, introduce themselves and then we'll go around to our colleagues um, on the right hand side um, and we'll also take um, those online. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Christopher Fry, member of this committee. Good morning, everyone. Member Baku Baku Force, member of the committee. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Khadil Barankis. Thank you very much. Um, the members online, if you could introduce yourselves, please. Good morning, Chair. Gerrit Pretorius, alternate member of the committee. Good morning, Chairperson. Member Rachel Van Fogham. Good morning, Member Kassim is also present. Thank you very much, members. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our colleagues on the on my right hand side. Dr. Lau Peterson, uh, CEO of ICRA. Good morning, everybody. Minister Shana Fernandez, Social Development with my team. Good morning, uh, Honourable Chairperson and uh, members. Uh, uh, the, my name is Robert MacDonald, uh, Head of Social Development. Good morning, Chair and Honourable Members. Charles Jordan, Chief Director, Children, Families and Vulnerable Groups. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Honourable Members. Patiswa Momoza, Director of Vulnerable Groups. Thanks. Good morning, Chair and Honourable Members. I'm Deborah Fortain, a Social Work Policy Manager for the Older Persons Programme. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we could just also just have the mic switched on at the end next to Marianne and just ask our guest, or if you can just stand and perhaps introduce yourself very loudly as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arun Abdo. I'm on behalf here of uh, the employees and the residents of Avandra Stays, Worcester. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm Philip Strayers. Uh, I'm on behalf of uh, Avandra Stays and Workers. Good morning, I'm Eleanor Fordy. I'm the manager of Alvarez, and I'm here on behalf of all the residents and the employees of Alvarez. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andre Gelantz, and I'm also here 
a concerned citizen uh, who stood regarding half of this oldage hall, and it's such a privilege to be here for the first time. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Enrico Fredericks, also part of the team for our address. Okay. Um, sorry, Minister. You said you wanted to. So Lawrence, all, the all the all the introductions are done. done. All the introductions are done. A very warm welcome to the guests joining us. Um, we are being assisted by our procedural officer, Ms. Namonde Tamke, as well as um, uh, Ms. Mary and who is also assisting us today with uh, specifically technical support as well. Um, I have also noted the apology of Member Plato, the chairperson of this committee, and Member Pretorius will be standing in for him as an alternate. We're then going to move on um, quite swiftly to the presentation, uh, which is a briefing by the Institute for Contemporary Research in Africa, and then we're going to uh, move on to questions and answers after that. Minister? Chair, if I may, um, without any due respect, I would like to be excused at 10.30 as I have a long-standing commitment which I need to honour at 11 a.m. However, the team will be here uh, to hold the fort if that's appropriate. I also do believe, and I do not wish to speak for the presenter, but I do believe that he has a family commitment which he needs to honour as well. Thank you. Perfect. So we will endeavour to get the questions and the presentation done before 10.30 and then we'll go on to the rest of the committee business. So, so you'll be doing the presentation. Perfect. If you can just switch your microphone on and then the presentation will be beamed to the members online as well. But I do understand that all members have a copy in their email um, as well. So members, um, if you are at home, you can follow on your computer. I'm just going to take a seat in a different position so I can see as well. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yeah, I, would, uh, I don't want to rush the presentation at all, uh, and I want to uh, give a fair amount of time to the questions as, as well. Uh, my wife last night had a mini stroke, so she's currently in hospital. She is OK. Uh, they're running some additional tests this morning. She had some strokes before as well. But if everything goes well, we expect her to be at home uh, later today as such. So that's the reason why I, I need to not waste any time, but I don't want to rush any business either. Thank you. Um, thank you for the request for a presentation. This is the request that we received. Uh, the Western Cape Provincial Parliament Standing Committee on Social Development invites you to attend a brief committee on the program and role of the Institute of Contemporary Research Africa in assisting the old age homes that are struggling to operate in the province. And that's what I will be addressing today. So what do we do? Um, in a one liner, we are building capacity for caring facilities. We have been involved with the Department of Social Services since 2015. Uh, so we're well experienced in, in what we do as such. But I think it's important that we also share with you uh, what is our orientation um, in building this capacity. As I said at the previous meeting or earlier meeting, um, I used to be an internal auditor at Provincial Treasury uh, some years ago, and social development was one of the departments that I was responsible to audit, as well as to audit uh, projects that they had at that stage as well. So our alignment is the following, that before entities can get any funding, uh, as you're familiar, the PFMA 31J states, two things. The entity must implement effective and efficient and transparent financial management and internal control systems. That is a requirement. Normally, it's then asked from the entities to provide the letter that they do have. Um, if they don't have uh, those effective and efficient control system of financial management internal controls, they must establish and implement effective, efficient and transparent financial management and internal controls, and they must provide uh, evidence to that effect. That becomes in a precursor for providing them funding. This article impacts uh, yeah, uh, the accounting officer of a department. 
because if you would transfer this uh, funding without those things being present, then it's con considered as financial misconduct, which can lead to a five-year prison sentence. So for us and for me as a pass, uh, in or whatever we do, we need to assist that the department can always meet this as well. And that has been our approach since we started uh, engaging with the department and working in cooperation with them in 2015. Uh, so what we do is we really um, take this seriously. Not many people is aware what is the effective and the efficient system of internal control. Uh, it's words that sound we sort of have the idea, but not everybody knows that effective ask, do you do useful controls? Efficient, are you wasteful in the controls that you have? That's a definition of effective and efficient. And certainly we found at all time level, they're not aware of this really means. So they often sign, uh, my experience, uh, they often <laughs> sign these documents and these undertakings without being aware of what they actually need to comply with. So they say it's in place, but it is, it, it is not in place. Certainly not when we assess them uh, to determine that. So those are the two things. They must implement it or they must establish and implement those system of internal control. The, the question then is to meet that, and we do capacity building for these facilities. The answer is, how do we do it? The question is, how do we do it? What is our approach? And our point of departure, it must be research based. So the framework that we have is research based. Um, it's aligned with the provincial government's uh, financial governance framework that's uh, part of the cabinet's uh, uh, guidelines, uh, policies that they have, and it has been accepted in 2008 uh, to, to that effect. So this framework has embedded that part as well because it preceded the development uh, of this framework as such. But it must be also practically implementable. Uh, it doesn't help you put anything up there and then nobody can really do and use it. So our research based approach must be comprehensive. It must provide to cover the most things that, that is required. It must be scalable. You can't expect, and you will see the framework a little bit later, you can't expect everybody to do everything. It's just not possible. Not even big companies can. Um, you know, so it must be scalable, but it must also allow you to have multiple starting points that you don't start at A and go back to C. You need to start wherever you the, the need or the requirement or um, emerges or the problem emerges and address it. And while you're addressing that, being aware that if you address this, it impacts and flows through the whole Altai charm as such. Um, I think it's important that I just share with you what is our governance definition. Because the framework answers a specific governance definition. Same as King. King defines governance in a certain way and therefore King addresses certain issues to meet that definition that he has as such. Similar with this framework. So if we define governance, we say governance is a result of specific processes in a facility that provide assurance to the stakeholders, members of the public sitting over there, uh, as well as uh, government, as well as family members, as well as the residents, as well as staff, providing an assurance, the stakeholders, that the capability of the organization, organization, that means time, effort, assets, and resources, are applied in a specific manner. It's applied so that objectives are achieved effectively and efficiently in a great ethical environment. Uh, I've shared you the effective and efficiently definition here is the same, useful uh, as well as not being wasteful. But the agreed ethical environment is critical because we sit with different ethnic groups. It's not about right and wrong. It's about if we run this old uh, can we reach with our stakeholders what is our values? What are the things that's important to us? And uh, when we build capacity, we try and instill that at the board level uh, or at the oversight group level uh, so that they, they can have that point of departure uh, as such and understand it. So it's not just business as normal. It's business in a specific, specific ethical environment that must be agreed. 
with careful consideration of the social, environmental, economical, and sustainable implications. Uh, and what do we do meet that? And I think you uh, will agree with me that that enables us also to meet the requirements of, of, of assist with the requirements of uh, the PFMA. Just an understanding of governance. The blue dice in the middle there, um, it says resources, benefit or need, ownership and management. To understand governance is a simple example that I often used. Um, I've got a cell phone and if you ask me this morning, can you use my cell phone? I most probably will say yes. Uh, and then you're going to say to me, maybe I'm going to phone uh, my child that is in uh, the UK and then I'll say no. <laughs> You cannot phone overseas, you know, uh, with my cell phone. So what happened? As long as the management and the stewardship is under my authority, my ownership, I've got no problem. I can do with my cell phone whatever I want. But the moment I give it to you, you now management a resource that I have. As soon as that happened, we split the ownership of the resource or the ownership of the need and we put it in the hands of somebody else who owns that now to address that and to manage that. Then governance become important. Then there's all lot of questions that needs to be asked. And we call it the governance drivers as such. Uh, and I think it's important uh, that, uh, that, that, that we know that as well. So for us, if we talk governance, it's not just nice words that sounds good on the ears and that is relevant for today there's detail behind this there is a proper research behind it there's a proper understanding behind this and then our values there on the left hand side just appearing there that needs to play a role and values are interesting thing you know um you can have something like uh, um you have to be transparent. The question is with uh, uh, Popia, how transparent are you allowed to be? What can you say? What can you not say as such? And there's also some other uh, rights and uh, that people have that limits being transparent as such, just to remark that the values is not that easily applied and it needs careful consideration and really needs on board levels careful training as such. So this is our govern universe. This is the universe that we develop to address that uh, definition and to assist with uh, PFMA. The reason why I share it, because I, I understand this, this is comprehensive. This is like going into so much detail. I'm not going to spend all the detail on it, uh, but it's to demonstrate to the committee that the work that we undertake, mm -hmm. it's not just fly by night. We can measure each and every step. We can account for each and every step. There's a reason behind each and every step. We don't do as we please in old age homes. Uh, we do what is best uh, for the old age home uh, in that regard. And if you research government, you will see that there's most probably three functional application areas that you must have. That is your strategic leadership, your management stewardship, and your control assurance. If you think about strategic leadership, it's subsections of planning and resource application. And so those in the department, strategic plan, medium term plan, annual business plan, operational plan, that are words that's familiar in the department. So again, our work is focused on that within the organization, because if you don't plan, if you fail to plan, you actually plan to fail. Uh, we had this in, um, uh, in Spitzkopf for many months, uh, and then uh, we went there last uh, week, a uh, week before last week, and we draw up a plan for the manager there. On our outlook, we scheduled all the reports, we scheduled all the salary moments, we scheduled all the um, uh, training that she needs to give on a diary for the whole year. We scheduled when she's available for resident, when she's available for that, when she has to buy food for that. And for the first time, her report, a quarterly report to the department was sent five days earlier uh, than in the past. Why? Because she's now focused. You know, I need to do this at this stage and uh, you take the stress away because you also realize I don't have to worry about the next thing because it's got a slot in my daily schedule as such. So planning is critical. Resource application. 
uh, data, IT resource. I'm not going to read everything, but you can see these resources. The uh, main thing there is a budget. Um, and uh, I let me just share something on the budget. It becomes difficult for us currently to uh, work on the budgets of the old age homes because we now in the first month of the next financial year, yet we haven't signed any agreements of the old age homes, hasn't signed any agreements yet for what the funding is that they're going to get. get. So we sit with salaries, issues that we have addressed, that created crisis as from 1st of April, you know, it will happen in the next few months, but it does make it difficult for us uh, or for the old age homes to uh, do better. Although we understand those constraints as such. Structure and relationships, um, the business processes in there, uh, performance management and your control assurance, which is internal and independent control assurance. Those are the areas in which you have to take activities. To give you an example, there's about 75 areas here, uh, expecting, uh, yeah, depending on how you slice and dice. Uh, but the processes behind this is about 780 different processes, uh, all linked to specific uh, risks, all linked to specific controls. Uh, the amount of controls is about uh, 13,000. So this is a comprehensive framework. And again, you can't implement everything, but the tool set that we have available to assist is extensive. And that's the assurance that I want to give the committee this morning as well. Then there are specific activities that need to take place to ensure governance. Not all activities is governance related activities. Um, five areas, control environment, enterprise risk management, information communication, control activities and monitoring. Um, interesting, look at the, the first control environment, governance culture, commitment to purpose, uh, capability. If staff does not understand why they do it, then they will not maintain that. You can't just tell staff, this is how you have to wash your hands. You need to give them the reason why. Why is it important? Therefore, the policies that we've developed uh, for old age homes, will give you what needs to happen, and then next to it, it will give you a rationale. You do this because of this, you do this because of this. That enable any oversight group, any RN, any manager to understand what the policies say. Uh, you can be a lay person, read, oh, if he doesn't do that, you're going to spread infection. That's easy to understand. But that makes it a useful uh, policy as such. That means people understand the purpose of that, and then they hopefully will uh, comply with it much uh, more stringent than otherwise. Control activities, a compliance, a safeguarding of assets, accomplice of objectives, reliability of information, effective and efficient use of resources. The last two, the use of the resources and the reliability of information is really some of the critical controls absent in old age homes. Uh, the information that we often get is not reliable information. Give you an example. We get the invoice in this month, but the goods hasn't been collected yet from the supplier. It will only be collected next month. It's, it's not a reliable information. To be reliable, reliable it must be um, uh, timely, it must be complete, and it must be accurate, and it must be valid. That's a requirement for valid information. If it doesn't mean that, if it's not timely, it's just out of time, then there's a problem. So wherever we manage and we uh, assist with management, our guide is that if you have a request for a payment, that your document that you submit as a supporting document to it, or the request document must say uh, it's valid, it's timely, it's accurate, you have to tick it off. And if it's not timely, you have to give explanation. Why is this before the time? Why is this late? So that management or whoever approves it has got the understanding for that. And if there's queries afterwards, you can come back and say, that's why it was, because, you know, sorry, a year later, you, you, you wouldn't know as such. And then you're monitoring there as such. Operational, financial, compliance, governance, environment, and report a resolution as such. Um, yeah. On the safeguarding of assets, on, on assets of control, we feel if we use this type of universe, there needs to be a priority in it. Uh, what do you do first? You can't do everything at once. Uh, which do you do first? Uh, and same with asset management is one of the things that we consider, uh, but we prior prioritize it not always that high because the asset of the old age home is actually limited asset. It's beds and cabinets and chairs, you know, and they move around all the time. So you need the asset uh, register that is flexible and movable. So what we often uh, advise and what we have done is take photos of the chairs and say, 
this is a photo of the chair, there must be 55 of them in the old age home. Go and check it. You know, this is a bed. There are seven of these types of beds. Go and check them. So you can move around and we know uh, what is what is there. But it's more than that. If you really want to manage assets, you need to have the value that is purchased. You need to show, you know, uh, what has been written off against the asset. What's the current book value? How did you get rid of that asset? What's the processes of selling or making asset redundancy? That becomes an enormous policy for an old age that wants to take care of uh, elderly with limited resources. So you have to be scalable incremental when you, when you look at asset management, for instance. So what we're saying is that if you want to achieve that governance, you, you need to have a tool, and that's our tool, to ensure that, that those things can happen. Just to sum up, research-based approach, comprehensive, scalable, multiple starting points, and it enables us to prioritize within our organization. So what are the things that we train people on? Um, uh, when we build their capacity uh, at facilities and assist them, and if they don't have the capacity, implement the capacity and put it on a system that we can later transfer to them. Uh, our tool set, I've shown you that, it's designed fit for purpose. Um, it's not just uh, do this and ticket, it must be effective and efficient. Governance, the board, the manager, financial staff, financial management, PFMA, income, procurement and expenditure, budget, banking, cash management, audit reports, stock management, asset management. Those are the areas that we kept to assist them with. But again, with their limited resources, we cannot do everything. We have to select one or some of these things. Kitchen management, resident management, oversight and training. In the one old age home, the kitchen uh, food bill was anything from 48 to 68,000 rand per month. Um, and we started implementing controls and we keep on implementing the controls uh, and better the controls and, and improve the controls and have them flexible and scalable and get the useful controls and get rid of the non-useful controls. When we found that two staff were taking some of the foods for themselves, they were suspended, uh, you know, depending on investigation or such, and then the bill came, off, uh, came down to 40,000 and never exceeded to 40,000. But they back uh, because of the labor unions and the things uh, that happened and apparently wasn't fair and they, they back under very string, uh, strict conditions. But we took some of the control away from them. Uh, and everything went well, so we between 30,000 and 35,000 rand for food, which is a budget uh, currently, except of three weeks ago when there was given uh, a kilogram of salt and uh, for one meal, because the salt, uh, there wasn't salt and just took the salt packet out. So yes, the salt just put the rest back on Monday. Monday, the kilogram salt was missing, it was gone. You know, so the people, according to them, must have had very salty food. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, 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 uh, really, s staff often are very, very creative in how they do do that. Resident management, oversight, and training. Uh, at Spitzkop, uh, we've got one resident there, uh, Mrs. Crom, out that gives us uh, so much. <laughs> that gives us so much time. We've now got footage and videos of. Uh, Throwing, throwing, giving the food, walking out of the kitchen and dump it outside, you know, for the cats to eat. Uh, it's terrible. So we are on a strategy. We are approaching now. We advise them to approach lawyers. Uh, so she will be evicted. She's not a, a category three. She's not a category two as far as we are aware. She's a category one. She is uh, not a resident in the home. She rents one of the flats. So we will provide uh, another flat for her to rent and then we will do eviction processes for such. She currently owes 42,000 rand in arrears uh, for her rent. She doesn't pay her rent. Uh, she, yeah, I'll want, uh, it's, it's nice stories, but we leave that for a bribe because that's where you can talk about these things and, uh, and taste them. But she gives the old age home a very, very, very hard time. Uh, and I think, uh, Social development is well aware, Minister. You're well aware if you get all the letters and about that. It's, it, 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 it is a difficult one for all of us. Oversight is a board, a system providing the oversight. 
founding documents, NPO, NPC, there's a certainly a big difference between having an NPO and an NPC. Uh, NPC allows much more stringent control uh, on the directors than the NPO will ever be. So uh, directors are in their own person as well as combinedly um, suitable for what goes wrong. It becomes very difficult in the NPO to do it because your members uh, is often the community uh, that's got the interest in there, but because of NPO constitution not diligently drawn up, it will say something like um, people staying in this community can be members of the organization. No member register. So now we've got the meeting and we say, okay, now we are select a committee and now we need, we need a new board. We need a new uh, oversight group for this old age showman. Uh, my friend doesn't like me, so he goes out to the community and says, okay, let's also have a meeting. And then, you know, you elect these people as a board and all of a sudden we've got two boards there. Because the, the NPO didn't really stipulate you, your members, you know, limit the amount, limit the qualification, limit whatever you need to do there and keep a membership list. Otherwise, to make any decision from members, uh, a reliable and executable decision means half of the community plus one must be present. And that will be a hard one. Whereas with the NPO, all those things are tied down. The Companies Act is very, very strict on that as such uh, to do that. Um, we also found that uh, in some instances uh, where there's NPOs and NPCs uh, jointly there, um, the NPCs, the NPOs normally doesn't own the buildings. I think that these are such instances, the uh, buildings that Padisa occupies is in an NPC company of the, of, 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 of the church. Uh, so uh, you, you don't owe that. Similar thing happened in uh, uh, in uh, Marisburg. Marisburg belonged belong to the Dutch Reformed Church in the Eastern Cape. They also had the housing department that owned all the buildings, all the old they the physical assets. They owed that, owned that. But they uh, uh, resolved, dissolved uh, some years ago. And um, Marisburg was the last one, Spitzkop was the last one on their books. All the other buildings was given back. So they said to Spitzkop, here's the NPC with the documents, with the certificate owning that, you know, so here is the NPC, uh, change the directors, change the resolutions, hand it in. So the NPC owns the building, but the NPO runs the old age home. Uh, so you have this link that we've developed between the NPC and the NPO uh, as such, which is an important link because it's a valuable asset uh, that, that's in there. Um, the critical thing on a board level is that it's operational, it is, it, it is oversight, it's not operational. And with NPOs, the board become operational. You know, I'm the, uh, the treasurer, guess what, I'm signing all the checks. Uh, you know, so uh, hence we've got a lot of uh, opportunity for corruption. Uh, and it also does uh, frequently happen as such. Uh, whereas in the NPC, the controls are much more stringent in that. Um, policy and procedures, how the home function, I did share you some of that. The management, the compliance, the SDIP. Um, the SDIP sometimes uh, uh, requests from, and it's correct, uh, for the old age home to require, uh, to, to meet requirements to do certain things. But it's not often prioritized well for the old age home. So they have to attend to certain things, whereas the priority is uh, on a different level, really, uh, in the old age home. Uh, you know, if we're trying to keep an old age home and looking at the sustainability uh, and do all those things, it becomes difficult for us to attend to matters that's a tick box, but doesn't contribute towards sustainability as such, especially with limited uh, resources. Um, management for operational accountability versus responsibility. A swap roles of staff, uh, and, and this is the interesting thing. Um, there's a, uh, in one instance, there's a committee of a, a supervisor for housekeeping, but doesn't manage a stock well. So a stock is three times the budget. Now the budget that we work out at Alto Chums is linked, the food budget is linked to the meals. So many kilograms of meat, meat costs you about this much, you know, allow for some increases. So we try and have a specific budget calculated on that. And same with, with the cleaning materials as such. So if you spend three times, we know something in your 
spending isn't uh, isn't correct. Something on your use isn't correct as such. You know, so we check on the spending. Once we satisfy that the spending is under control, in the sense that the board, the buying, there's nothing wrong with the buying, the right quantities are bought, uh, then we start looking at the usage of that. Now, because there's no improvement there, we, we try and move the control for the uh, the stock of the uh, of the supervisor for cleaning towards or for housekeeping towards um, uh, towards the kitchen, which manages stock excellent to their supervisor. Now we've got a big who are, why can't I do it, why don't you do it, you know, it's, it's not easy just to implement it. The staff gets upset and they don't understand it and they feel, you know, uh, they, they think, you know, it's deliberately done. They don't, they don't understand what the big process is be, uh, behind that. Performance managed uh, that is output-based out, uh, out, um, output um, and we make sure that there's clear roles and the responsibilities. But it takes time to introduce to the staff any policy and train them in, in that policy. You've got limited time, so it, it takes a while. You need to be consistently going through it on a consistent basis. Governance of oversight. We want to provide assurance to stakeholders, compliance, accountability. This is important to DSD norms and standard, level of care, medication, building requirements, kitchen and laundry requirements, legal prescript agreements, SLA minimum requirements. Um, and we often find that documents supporting this goes missing in the old age homes uh, because they just manually there. So whenever we get involved, we start with electronic saving of data, capturing that data. So if somebody <coughs> steal their leave records, you know, and say you owe me leave, then at least you got it electronically as well. If you steal a computer, we get you a new computer and you're up and running because all the systems are offline and are backed up offline and then run from an offline system. So we safeguard uh, that. Uh, we've had too much experience where things just uh, disappear as such. Financial management, accounting and planning software, that's something that we that we provide and assist them in getting. Um, from our side, uh, we've managed to secure uh, 25 licenses uh, from Microsoft uh, uh, because we also uh, uh, NPC, or we're NPC uh, and um, which we then distribute to some of the old age homes to bring them online to use uh, online filing systems if they want to use it. If they do it on their own, uh, it can be, well, it's actually complex. Uh, but it's such a process, and if you don't know what you do in the data mine uh, management, uh, you mess it up and you rather stay with, with a manual system. Uh, but that's what the financial management uh, consists. Payment authorization, no single individual access to all. Uh, kitchen expenses, ratio management. Let me say something about ratio management. Um, whenever we deal with financials in the old age home, we give them a report, I actually think uh, it's two slides <coughs> further. So let me speak on it when I'm two slides further. I'm going to address the ratio management uh, within the next two slides that is coming. Uh, running cost centers as part of that. Financial management, our budget, I did say what our current uh, uh, struggle with the budget is. Um, operational, pocket money, petty cash, donation, cash, cash management. Those sounds easy things, but once you, if you don't have an effective, efficient uh, system of internal control, that's a loophole for money just to go to waste uh, as such and just to, uh, you know, uh, be misused. Uh, and uh, if I say waste, I actually wanted to say it's a big area that's ripe in many instances for fraud. Uh, and corruption, uh, even from family members that comes and, you know, under the pretense to buy the resident something, uses the pocket money for their own advantages, because they demand that the pocket money must be given to them. Okay, so when we involve, we focus very strongly on financial reports for the old HM. That means maximum 10 to 11 days, depending on where the uh, the month in falls, by where the Saturday and the Sunday falls. We provide a report on the finances for the old age home, for the board, um, for the oversight group, um, within 10 days up to the end of the previous month. Because say, if I give you a report that's two months old, you're two months down the problem already. 
it just escalated. So we say within 10 days, if the accounting system is up and running, there's no reason why you cannot give it. There's no reason why you can't make a provision for the invoice that you haven't received because you've got a fair idea what the invoice is going to be. So you are supposed to be able to give that. And then we give them actual versus budget with a year to date report. So this is your month. Uh, this is a, what you budgeted for this month. This is your uh, year to date uh, totals for the period. Uh, as well as your year-to-date budget. So it's a comparative figure that they can see and that they can compare and see where, e where are the anomalies, where do we need to focus, where is the emerging issues that we do have. Um, that report and that ability enable us to pick up at Spitzkop that just on the garden, the water of the garden, escalated in March uh, to 80,000 rand. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of water for the garden. So, uh, but we pick it up immediately. So, in contact with the municipality, you have to come and check the meter because the garden is not uh, in operation currently. There's just no use, no way that the pump could run and provide that amount of. So, there must be electrical fault. But having those reports so constantly, I mean, not six months. Ah, oh, you know, we think last year, November, there was a problem because there was escalated. You know, having this information available enables effective and efficient management as well. Ratio, we break it down. If I say to you that uh, electricity should be around to 35 and we've budget uh, 30,000, it's big numbers, you know, and, and uh, even normal staff, even I in those instances for any organization struggle to say what it must be. But if I say to you we've got 44 residents there and we spent about 800 rand per person for electricity, then all of a sudden your experience are aligned with the number that we give you in this ratio management as such. So we take food, so you can compare groceries, we take soft salaries, there's a couple of headings that we take and we give them on a monthly basis a breakdown and also on a monthly basis see what is the unit cost, what was the loss per unit cost or what was the profit that we make or surplus that we have uh, as per unit, unit cost. That is a very rare occasion but sometimes uh, because of some factors for a month there is uh, break even uh, as such. But that makes it tangible. So even for the staff, we give a ratio. The electricity use uh, per staff member, you know, is uh, 1,200 rand per month. So the staff can relate to their own home where they may be four or five people living and say, how much is your electricity bill? The complaint that they give us, we don't stay here. I said, yes, you don't stay here. But guess what? The resident doesn't ask me for a for a salary increase, you do. Uh, the resident doesn't switch off the lights, you can. So if I can see a saving on the lights, then I know you have performed and we note those savings, uh, you know, and if it comes to the year and we see if there's any surpluses uh, derived from that savings, that we can maybe give a small percentage back to the staff as a, as, as a bonus as such. It's not always that easy. Uh, I'm nearly done as such, uh, audit report. Um, uh, a lot of uh, our boards doesn't understand a balance sheet or a annual financial statements. It's just a document for them. Um, they don't understand that a balance sheet is giving you a view of the organization on one day at the end of the year. On that day, this is what the financial position was. Whereas uh, income and expenditure give you an overview over the period uh, under review. For the year, this is how uh, what the result was, you know, if you add up everything in January, in February, in March, and carry through, you know, till your financial year. In. It's not a forensic uh, report. Don't expect auditors to pick up that. The auditors uh, only want to make sure that the information provided to them is uh, sources is adequate and that those information is reliable. That's what they want to know. Uh, so there, if they express this is a uh, this is the income, they want to know that it's reliable. As they said, this is the salaries, they want to know that that salary expense is reliable. Those are the things that they check. Whether you employ 10 more people or paid somebody more that you should, uh, they won't pick that up. Uh, it's not a forensic uh, audit as such. Um, so a reasonable assurance of the documents presented that support the financial statements. That's what they need. And a lot of board and people don't understand that as such. Uh, the income pension, trust money. A lot of organizations and older gyms doesn't understand it's trust money. 
um, when do you have to pay it back, when you can use it to the benefit of the residents, the rent, the pocket money. So we've got, wherever we go, we've got a resident account for each resident. This is what he received in pension. This is how much he paid out in cash to that person. Uh, and this is the rent that he has paid for it. So you ask us for the last month, for the last year, for the last, uh, since, since we've been there, uh, the systems that we put up for the old age home allows him to give that. So if there's any discrepancy, the records is there. Um, and uh, the subsidy, we often say to them, remember, these the promise is not to provide all your costs. They won't subsidize all your costs. Uh, there's a big expectation on old age homes that because we government funded, they have to provide all our costs. And it's not going to happen. It's never happened. It wasn't the agreement in any case. Um, constraints that we have is on organizational level funding. Funding is a constraint for us currently. Um, and if I say something, I, I, I know is the, well also yes, funding is a constraint. It's a constraint for them as well, <laughs> you know. So so we understand those processes. Uh, we understand, but it's really really. Uh, uh, it, it, it creates big crises out there. Salary increases, minimum wage. Um, that has escalated now, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it creates a problem. If the subsidy stays the same, it creates a problem. Uh, especially the standalone homes, they haven't got additional resources to do that, uh, you know, to, to obtain those fundings. They're, the family of the residents are also struggling. Um, so unsustainability is becoming a reality and it's a growing reality. Uh, and closure becomes a reality as such. So after and during establishing and implementing, I'm summing up uh, the presentation. So we're now involved and we're now um, establishing and implementing. And after we started that process and during being busy with that process of effective, efficient and transparent financial management internal control, application of funding is maximized. So we reach a point where we can say there's no waste in this old age home. There's no more savings that we can get anywhere. This is it. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't cut, we can't cut uh, anything anymore. Uh, so at that stage, we know the facility is sustainable under certain circumstances or needs to prepare for closing down. And this is not an option. This is a financial reality. Uh, currently, the water and electricity bill uh, to the Beaufort Bates municipality uh, is reaching a million. We are sitting, setting aside between 20 and 23,000 rand a month to be in a position to negotiate with them. If we give them the money, they just wrote it off against the rest and there's still hundreds of thousands left. So we've more than a year in consulting with them. You keep on writing letters, you keep asking response, you never, there's no responses back uh, of it. Uh, and uh, the strategy that we have is we put that money aside. If there's emergency the old age home, we, we, we utilize some of that money. But once they're willing to write it off, we can make an offer and say, listen, we have saved up the last year, we've got 120,000 Rand in cash uh, that we can provide you as a settlement agreement in your right of all uh, uh, the arrears. But guess what? After they written off the arrears, we're going to build up arrears again. It's not sustainable. So what you said, you said with boards, that's all of a sudden be aware, we're now accountable for not paying electricity. You know, what's going to happen one day? If they demand it, what's going to happen? You know, uh, how are they going to be personally involved in that? And some of them really has got level of integrity. So they sit and say, I can't in good faith manage an organization that I know is going down the drain. You can, in any case, according to the uh, Companies Act, you cannot run an organization if you are aware that it's not financial feasible going forward. Uh, that's uh, a no-no in the Companies Act and you will be dealt with severely yes, as such. So doing all this and having said all this, uh, you know, we get to a point when if we engage with, uh, with these things, say this is our 
then, then there's really not much more than can be. We can move a little bit funds around, but we cannot. Uh, we don't have the means to to, to get the uh, the shortages. Our uh, website is currently under construction, so this uh, maybe there's a question, and maybe we get an answer. So, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peterson, for that presentation. Members, we're going to move directly into questions. Um, I note Member Baku Baku Force, Member Brunkes, and Member Fry. Um, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, I welcome the presentation. First of all, I want to ask from slide to what works in the Institute doing for the department. And if if it's capacity building, then how many NPOs is it assisting per year? How has the work helped improve service delivery in the funded NPOs? That's my first question. I also uh, 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 want to raise that we have a challenge of NPOs that are not funded due to non-compliance. What measures are in place? to bring an end to this and help to the department and NPOs to improve that service deliver. Some of the questions you already answered that was on my mind. Um, in slide four, one of the challenges experienced in the province is many NPOs that are not compliant. What advice has ICRA given to the department with regards to capacitating both funded and unfunded NPOs in the province? As you already mentioned, sometimes <clears throat> the, uh, the 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 NPOs they will uh, give you the information or the report that is not a uh, uh, um, hundred percent uh, uh, uh. okay all right so uh to 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 end that what are you what are you doing because my understand yeah they may not be giving uh, uh the, the, the the they may not be meeting the expect expectation of the department but uh can you uh can you elaborate maybe further? What are you exactly doing once once you 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 find such NPOs, uh, so that you know that at least if because I saw at the end, yeah, sometimes you, you will end up closing down those uh, NPOs. So um, and maybe between twelve and eighteen months. But uh, if you can elaborate, what exactly that you are doing to capacitate them? once you, you, you pick up the, 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 those um, uh, challenges that they have. And uh, on slide 14, can you give more details of this tool set use and how have this improved capacity in the department and funded NPOs? And yeah, the and what the most common challenges experienced in the social development space and how to how do this tool set assist to address them? On my last question is on slide 17. What must the government to what must the government do to improve financial management in the funded NPOs? What is the current practice to monitor and evaluate the expenditure trends and to prevent financial mismanagement in the in funded NPOs? You mentioned you mentioned some of the, 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 the tools that you are using. But uh, if you can go deeper or uh, be specific, uh, uh, the problem, uh, I, 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 no, let me not go there. But I would like to, I, I would love to, to, to know more uh, uh, about it. And um, in our visit uh, in Kailicha, it was last year, if I can remember, there was a I raised even that. I, I think I told some. Oh, if I didn't tell my you, not my friend, my <laughs> my my minister that day, there was something that uh, uh, we picked up in Kailicha. 
there is this uh, old age home. We understand that in the old, old, old age home, you have a certain um, age that you are taking in. But in that uh, NPO, there were some residents who's been staying there more than 20 years, but they are younger than the, 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 the number of age that you are st st taking there. And um, we, we learned that in that, uh, in that um, old age home, the new board members doesn't want them. They, because they are not getting Ilanduka is subsidy from you. But at the same time, the, the, the old age home is not complying. They, but they get um, e assistant, fund, funding assistance from the department. And it was so funny to us what's happening exactly here because they are not registered because they are not comply or they are not complying according to the to the information from the new manager that was there but still they are getting money from the department so it was confusing thank you thank you very much members member baku baku force has asked all of your questions so um, <laughs> nobody else will get an opportunity <laughs> member Branca, it's over to you <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Chair, yes, and good morning to uh, everybody again, to the department. Uh, and thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, I have a very simple question uh, in terms of the uh, the NPO and NPC statuses of the, 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 the old age homes. Uh, for instance, if an uh, old age home, uh, if they are registered with the department and they receive a, a subsidy from the department, if they go about uh, changing the NPO status uh, to a NPC, uh, for example, without uh, uh, letting the department know, or without informing the department, uh, what could be the, 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 the repercussions and what could be the, the, the outcome of uh, such an uh, act of, a, uh, of, a, of a old age? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Fry? Thank you very much. And firstly, may I say uh, our thoughts are prayers with you, with your wife uh, in this mm -hmm. difficult time. I just have one question. Um, I just want to see that, um, and it's just a question of clarity on your governance universe um, slide. I don't know what number the slide is. Um, at the end, there's monitoring. Um, is, is it monitoring and evaluation? or is evaluation done separately? Because I, I, it wasn't clear for me in the presentation where the, where the evaluation part comes in, um, because monitoring must be coupled with evaluation at the same time. So um, I'm grateful for, for, for the work that you're doing in, in the MPO and MPC space, especially in the uh, old age home or assisted care facilities. Um, but I just want to check where, did, where does the evaluation actually fit in the governance universe? Thank you. Thank you, Member Fry. Uh, Member Philander, online. Good morning, Good morning Chairperson. Chairperson. Um, um, am I allowed a question? Yes, you are. You're a Member of Parliament. Thank you so much, Thank Chairperson. So much, Chair, Chair, I have a facility-specific question, but I am very mindful of the doctor's um, family ob obligations, and I just want to echo the sentiments of the Honourable Fry, um, wishing the doctor's wife all the best, um, and our prayers accompany the family. Um, Chairperson, we have as a committee, when I was a member of the committee at the time, paid a visit to the rest of Old Age Home in Paul East. Um, and there has been certain correspondence um, in relating to the conditions of the Old Age Homes and obviously the location, which when it was initially, initially established, um, which was not the case, but I believe that the conditions has worsened. Now, listening to in terms of um, what a facility should be like and what it is, um, I almost want to say, appraised on. Um, and it also includes the, the the monitoring and the evaluation as well as the, the, the external conditions. Now, I can, I can say um, and confidently so that there's no issue in terms of the management um, of the facility as well as to how the old age um, people get taken care of. But the conditions surrounding that facility is definitely not conducive for their well-being. 
um, there was an option or an alternate um, presented at the time um, of the old JJ de Prie Leroux Clinic in Paul, which upon our visit, Chairperson, I think you were still the Chairperson at the time as well, where we saw that that facility is used as a storage facility. So um, without going into greater depth, as I am mindful of the time, um, in such a circumstance, in such conditions, um, will this not become a priority or at what extent, where exactly does one need to raise this? Um, and I mean, how often is the inspections taking place? Is there visits taking place that that considers those um, conditions that the, the establishment um, is currently um, located in and then accordingly can also motivate for, for that um, facility to be um, otherwise located at a location which is uh, perhaps available or can be made available um, for such. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member Philander. Member Bakpakofors, was that a fifth question from your side or one, two, three, four? The last class. Five, six, this is the sixth question, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Must Patrick. be short. I'm sorry. Because we've only got like, uh, about no, 20 minutes left. Now that he, uh, I forgot, he mentioned something about more respect. Um, uh, old age home. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm just uh, want to know about uh, that, the problem, if it's solved in that area, because there was a, a cry that uh, the, the board members has been there more than a decade, more than maybe 50 years. They've been board, board members. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the, the challenge has been resolved. I, I'm just curious to know about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Member Van Vohal. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, I'm actually um, covered by the previous uh, uh, members, but I just want uh, uh, the presenter to allow right on the issue of the eviction I, I i missed that part and i'm not sure uh, uh um perhaps he explained because for me it's it's unacceptable if you evict an elderly person but perhaps they have a good reason but but my 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 question is can the person afford to pay um yeah i just need clarity on that Thanks, Chair. And then the other issue, sorry, Chair, is there some, do you have a monitoring system in place um, to monitor racism? Um, one of the issues in, in Marisburg is Marisburg, it was one of the issues was racism. So do the, the government have a system in place to monitor and engage or intervene when they pick up uh, racism in, in the different uh, old age homes? Thanks, Chair. Thank you um, very much. Um, I'm now going, then going to hand over to the doctor to answer. Um, I've picked up that some of those questions are also questions that the department can also answer. So I'll give uh, free reign to colleagues from the department to also respond to those. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, certainly uh, on the monitoring evaluation on what the department does, uh, that falls within the boundaries of the department as such. As from ICRA side, we independent organization out there, uh, NPC ourselves, uh, that since 2050, especially focus on assisting uh, DSD locally uh, to meet their objectives and to assist them with these old age homes first by assessing the old age homes, assessing new applications uh, and those type of things, and also to get involved. I think the total was uh, in the five years time on five old age homes. Uh, that we assisted with the management and embedded of which uh, uh, the last one that we handed back and I think which was the most successful one was in Kaya uh, as such. Uh, so there's always been a good uh, working relation between us and, uh, and the department as such, um, where we try also if there's any incidents at Old Age Homes to inform them there's the incidents at the Old Age Home. Uh, so by the time that somebody contacted the department, the department's already aware of the issues and even our response at that time. 
but for the last two years, he wasn't funding really to utilize us from the department side anymore and employ, employ us in this level, which is answering to some of your questions. So where we're involved currently with Altage Homes is where Altage Homes and us have a relationship or they approach us and say, listen, you've been here in the past, you know, can you sort this out for us? Can you assist us here? And we then engage with the board and assist them with, with any difficulty that they have. Um, similar with, with, a, uh, with a Spitzkop, um, because there's a staff uh, need for uh, another um, uh, administrative person or an administrative person to assist the manager, you know, from ECRA's side, that we decide to don't charge our services uh, to them anymore from November last year. So whatever we do, therefore, is free. The accounting services that um, uh, that we used to do, um, uh, Grunewald and Associates is doing that at a very reduced fee, uh, also preparing the financial statements and hand it over to the auditors. And after last year, the auditors reviewed those financial statements, uh, you know, and all the supporting documents, the auditors said, OK, in the future, they will cut the cost of the audit fees because a lot of work are done by, uh, you know, so that the audit fees for last year is 2750 It's nothing. You know, so this this is what we try and do is utilize our resources maximum. Um, so currently, you know, I don't aware of all the other old age homes. The department's much in better position to say that. Um, what I can say is our experience has been that uh, management and the boards aren't that equipped uh, mm -hmm. to deal with it on this level. They just they just don't have it. It's often people that's got a passion for what they do. Uh, but often not had the uh, opportunity to build up experience and knowledge uh, really on that as such. So our involvement is currently is where uh, people ask us and then we try and engage that as such. Um, on the NPO, uh, NPC, uh, NPC can also register as NPO. Uh, the NPO Act provides for that. So where there's existing NPO, uh, it can actually switch over on the NPC, which means the controls uh, changes. Uh, the problem is once it was an NPO and you want to switch it over to NPC, um, if, if it was with members, because the NPO demands that they must be members, the NPC can be either with members or without members. Uh, that's, that's what the Act allows that. But it can be switched and really to, you know, if, if the department comes to say, but NPCs must also now re-register as an NPO, you know, that can be done. The anomaly that there is is somebody like Bedista who's only got, a, speak on a correction, only got one NPO number, but they've got many LTH homes. Uh, you know, so uh, one has to take into account what, what happens in the past as well. Um, but we need, uh, in the case of Marysburg, we need to be clear between the NPC and the NPO, uh, what's the role of the NPO and what's the role of the NPC in that instance, because the one owns the building. You cannot just say, I'm an NPO, now I've got the building. That building is registered in a company, uh, a non-profit company, you know, and you can't just take it out and register it. There's directors involved, and there's a lot of things involved, and it was church property in any case. So originally that NPC was a, uh, NPO was, similar to Bedisa, was a church-driven uh, facility as such, and uh, the, the, that has changed. Um, I hope that answers it. The evaluation. Um, this framework that I showed you, this is a governance framework. So if the old age home applies, it, if the management of the old age homes apply, it, you know, they have to monitor their operational. They have to monitor their financial. They have to monitor their compliance as such. Uh, they need in the first instance, because they are accountable for the elder to do that. Um, if, if this framework is utilized, because the framework for, uh, for government, um, the financial governance framework of Western Cape also got those areas as such. And if they want to call it monitor and evaluation, they can do that. In other words, you're starting to add a value to your, uh, to the monitoring of it. Uh, you know, is it really fully compliant? You know, is it nearly there? Uh, you know, is it partially or 
he said, non-compliant at all. Uh, that's something that the department can such do. But this is our tool set. When we go in for an organization, we run a facility, please come and help us. You know, uh, what we do to bring them to a point where they can really sit, we're not just closing down because it's difficult. We don't decide to close them down. We just give them the reality. Uh, you know, if this is a trend, you're going to run up so much debt. You know, you're not as a business, you're not uh, feasible anymore. You're against the Companies Act, you're against, uh, you know, uh, even, even as a board member, as an executive committee, as a year you know, you, you're running now into serious problem uh, trying to go on. That decision of closing down is something that needs to be communicated with the department. All I'm saying is, at that point, if we are involved, we can give the assurance to the department, yes, you know, they, they have to close down. There's nothing more than we can slice and dice in, this, uh, in the system itself uh, with that. Um, cost. Um, um, the, the, the question about eviction, uh, the problem that you have in an old age home is if you got somebody like the, the case I referred to in Marysburg, uh, to provide food for that residence to clean her room. She's a private resident in a private flat. Funding is used from the elderly and subsidy is used from the elderly in the kitchen to provide the food. So we sit with somebody that doesn't want to pay it because uh, she, she doesn't engage at all. She doesn't engage with the board. Uh, she runs away. I was there uh, more than a little bit than three weeks ago. I try and speak to her and she just ran off and says, speak to my lawyer. We wrote her email because we get hold of email. She says, uh, my lawyers are Cliff and Decker. If you phone Cliff and Decker, they haven't heard about it. You, you know, so the board can't see her. She shuts the door in the face. She doesn't come out, you know. Uh, yet she comes out when and as she pleases. But to provide the services for her, we are actually using the funding of residents, category three residents and a subsidy to prepare the food for that. We cannot withhold the food because contract wise, a contract refers that for staying there, you know, this is what we will provide and she has to pay the rent. If she doesn't pay the rent, we can't just say, no, no, we're not going to provide. Then there's other legal avenues that we have to pursue to say, we're going to evict you because you don't pay. Um, there's just a, a legal uh, principle that, you know, if you don't pay your car, I can't just say, take your car away. There's processes before the bank can reprocess your car and can, uh, they can't just turn up and say, so we haven't, so you haven't paid three months, you've been taking the car now. Uh, and it's similar with her. You know, in the past, she was dealt with as if she can be a resident in a home. And the last uh, effort last year indicated she's, um, uh, she's not a category three. Uh, she is not a resident, she stays in the, the flats that's part of the home, but where people stay in that's still, uh, you know, capable of taking care of themselves. She stay in such a flat. So uh, going the legal route means we appoint a lawyer and the lawyer needs them to deal with it according to legal. We don't want to put anybody out, but we cannot justify using somebody that's a category three sitting there is not even aware of what's happening around him using some of his or her or his some of his and everybody else in the chain funding to provide food to somebody that willfully doesn't pay it or willfully just uh, miss it so the, the, that the, that is a, a struggle that we have in there um The last thing that I want to say, I think what makes us a valuable asset for the department and even for the committee is that we provide an independent view. There's no benefit for us except the money that we charge to do it. You know, my mother uh, is in, in an old age home in the West Coast. I've never engaged a department or an old age home on anything of my expertise on how I think it should be happened there. I'm not getting involved in that. She's my mother there. I'm just a child uh, as such, because there's no way that I can use my position and speak to the department or the social worker and say, hey, you know, by, by the way, there's X, Y, and Z. You know, so we steer clear away uh, from any involvement or I steer clear away from it. But for the rest, it's independent. There's, there's, there's no, you know, um, the department can be blamed for X, Y, and Z. We, we can't really be blamed because here is our assessment of that, you know. Um, and uh, based on talks in the past, I think if the department had the funding, they might have used some of those services 
uh, a gang, you know. Um, but they need to speak on the value that they got out of it. Um, you know, but if there's no funding, there's no funding. So from ourselves, lastly, we're turning a little bit of directions. We're now approaching people like the Yanni Mouton Foundation and other big funders that also fund organizations. Mm -hmm. Listen, this tool is available to you as well, you know, when you provide funding. Thank you, Chair. I hope I've answered everything if I missed somebody there. Thank you very much. We've got a very capable minister who's also going to catch um, anything that she thinks you've missed. So, Minister, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it's important to just express a word of thanks to Dr. Peterson. This is clearly, there's a lot of insight in this presentation that is often not out there in the public domain. Um, we have the Department for Older Persons here. We've got Dr. McDonald, Chief Director Jordan, who will answer directly to the questions. But we monitor about 300 old age homes in the province, if I'm correct, um, and there's about 117 that we fund, more or less. And one of the biggest fallouts is post-COVID. We have seen many of these, and not only old age homes, here we could talk about all facilities the operational costs have increased significantly and the funding that we received, many of you would have been through the budget cycle, DSD received a 4.05% uh, increase in terms of our budget, so it becomes increasingly difficult. But there's one other important factor that I need to mention, and that is we, the department can manage norms and standards in a facility, but we cannot interfere in the day-to-day -day management, the board management of a facility. And that is often where we find problems arise. When a board gets taken over, it could be political instability, it could be all sorts of things that happen. And then the department needs to look at this uh, squarely in the face and say, what are the areas that we are responsible for? And so if it is, let's just say the example, people indicate that they are poorly fed or that the place is not well maintained, then we will send a team out. But if someone says there's infighting between the chairperson and the treasurer, makes it very difficult uh, for the department to go in and be objective. And maybe that is where an independent organization with no affiliation to government per se, would be able to assist. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why we have this presentation today. Because for me, I've actually benefited and learned quite a lot from just listening to, uh, if we could have this as a permanent tool, it would be amazing. But I mean, we just don't have the money. That's the sad reality. So I think what we should do is ask the homes and generally homes that can that are well managed don't require this kind of toolkit. It's the homes that require the support and do not have the funding that could benefit from the toolkit that ECRIP provides. So I just thought I'd share that um, because I often receive calls, whether it's from a Spitzkop in Marysburg all the way through to Kyle Leacher. Um, and unfortunately, I have to hand it to the department. They must in turn follow the process and the protocols regarding monitoring, evaluation, norms and standards and intervene as and where we can. Just on the question of Member Philander's question, we have seen a degradation generally we have some of our facilities that used to be housed in what would be considered good areas that are now gang infested areas. And we cannot just relocate a facility. Unfortunately, there is a process which Dr. McDonald will expand on how you have to engage with the Department of Infrastructure, but we're constantly looking to national public works and provincially the Department of Infrastructure for suitable buildings. But you also heard Dr. Peterson talk about the complexities and NPCs, the owner and an NPO managers. So it's, it's not as simple, uh, you know, as it would seem. And managing the board of an old age home comes with a responsibility 
and there needs to be an element of ethical leadership, integrity and trust between the board and of course uh, the residents and the employees and many of the cases that are reported to me are cases where there is a breakdown between either the management and the board and the residents or the employees. So there's an employee employer issue as well that also needs to be addressed. But Dr. Peterson, thank you. Despite your challenging circumstances for making the time to come and share with us and thank you to the members for the insightful questions um, to the acting chair. If with your permission, I could hand over to Dr. McDonald and the rest of the team. Um, I want to say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Before we do that, I'm mindful that we've got three minutes left where we have you and Dr. Peterson. And I just wanted to check if there was anybody from the members of the public that had any specific questions, very short questions. And if you could indicate if those questions are, if them you want them to be answered by the, um, Dr. Peterson and the minister, or if they can be answered by the department because they'll still be here. OK, so if you could just come to the microphone and ask your very short question. And just. My name is Harun Abdul. I'm from uh, Labo. I'm the general secretary of Labo. Engaged with Avendris, uh, the employees, as well uh, as the board. I have heard uh, your answer on the question of uh, Khalil. When you ask you, can a, uh, in, can a NPC or can a NPO move to a NPC? You say yes. I'm not agreeing with you. <coughs> uh, why did I not agree with you on that doctor? With all respect, is that an NPO cannot move to a NPC, a NPC can go to a, can move uh, to a NPO. <coughs> uh, then my next thing, uh, question is that uh, this NPC is now established. He, take, he took over the NPO. So the assets, the buildings, all those belongs to the, to the NPO. But now the NPC, they are selling the assets they also want to to get the building, but they don't have funds. They are using the funds of the NPO, which social services uh, annually uh, budget for them, uh, the subsidy of five five million something like that, which they receive. But now the NPC, they don't have money. They are using the NP NPO's money. So what is uh, that regarding uh, the policy or the monitor and evaluation, is there in any illegal activities in that regard? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you um, very much. Uh, Dr. Avdir. Yeah. Uh, we've been involved with Alvin Trust uh, a number of years ago. Um, our first involvement was uh, on request of the department and under auspices of the department. The problem at Arvind Rus is that the NPO, as you call it, still belongs to, uh, I think it's called the Wooster Welsijnsvereniging. That doesn't exist anymore. That's the title deed is, is in that name. So when we got involved, the only person that was still on that board was, uh, um, uh, I forgot his name, but he recently passed away. Oh, yeah, uh, elderly gentleman. He was the only guy. So when we engaged in forming the NPO, he gave his authority as the only representative of that old uh, organization. He gave permission that we can move over to a NPO, or to a NPC. That, that was it. There was no, if you look at the constitution of that, there, there's just, there was just nothing except the buildings that, uh, that, that belong there as such. Uh, so that buildings is not registered in the NPO's name. It's registered in an organization's name that is defunct currently. It does not exist. So just that process of doing that is a, is, is, is a challenging process. 
And when we left there some uh, three or four years, four four years ago, when we after we've left there uh, and formed the NPC, we said one of the instructions was you now also have to transfer the property to that, uh, to, you know, to, to, to the NPC. Otherwise, it sits there. Uh, the question is, who can we can lay hold of the property? If somebody wants to claim the property uh, for debt, who are they going to approach? So it's the property just hanging out there. Um, when we were involved, one member left of that old board, you know, and he said, well, I'm the only one left, you know, I'll sign and that's fine. And he was in part of the NPC going forward as well. So the, that's the process uh, involving that. But, um, Chair, uh, if we need to discuss this on board level on that side, uh, um, you know, if, if the current chairperson of the board uh, wants to meet with the with the residents and we discuss that, you know, I'm willing to go there and, and give the views and assist uh, with the involvement and understanding of that as such. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peterson. And um, again, on behalf of this committee, we wish your wife a speedy recovery. And we thank you for making time to engage with the committee and for delivering um, a presentation to us. Um, I'm certain, I'm not the chair of this committee, but I'm certain the chair will call you back at some point uh, because on the Aventris issue, I remember when I was still the chair, member Brunkes proposed that we visit there. And I know that the committee went to the old age home. I've just read the report. Um, and we'll make sure that that's available as well. And I think what we will do is maybe ask the department to lead that discussion um, to ensure that there's a conversation between the board um, and the representatives of the community and the union with yourselves as well to see how Avendris, um can be assisted. So thank you to you for, for joining us and thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, the department will stay on to answer any questions that the HOD uh, would like to address as well. But the minister will just quickly, and uh, Dr. Peterson will quickly leave us. No. So just to check Dr. McDonald and Mr. Jordan, were there any responses or inputs that you wanted to give? Uh, thank you, honorable members. I think there's a few questions that went unanswered. Um, <laughs> as, <laughs> I think the first thing that I would like to say, um, the older persons program that's managing older chums is in a crisis. We've been cut 16 million rand last financial year. Um, that has not been given back to us. So we're sitting in a situation where we are really in a crisis financially. And Dr. Lowe has alluded to quite a few things and he's quite correct. As a department, we've always um, recruited the organization to assist us with certain in-depth financial stuff. But because of the fact that our badges have been cut so dramatically, we couldn't reappoint um, a lot of organizations. We're seeing a situation right now where there is some older person service centers closing down because of the lack of funding. Um, there's a, quite a few of them that's non-compliant. Um, Debbie, I think it was about 15 this year, 16. This financial year from 1st of April that won't be funded anymore due to non-compliance, due to them not meeting operational requirements. Um, this this is quite, quite a concern for us as a department, a big concern. So that's also why I specifically mentioned this to the standing committee as an, a committee that can that have an oversight and lobbying um, um, process involved. 
If I look at monitoring, um, things that we do as a department is we do monitoring according to norms and standards of the Older Persons Act. What does that include? That includes that we cannot first and foremost appoint a board of any old age home. We're not allowed to. We don't have the we don't have the mandate. So the NPO Act specifically is very clear that there is a board that needs to be appointed. The constitution of the old age home would say how that board needs to be elected every two years. And it's usually part of community members that that's being uh, co-opted and, and elected into it but we as a department have no mandate to appoint those board members or fire them neither do we not have a mandate to appoint any staff or fire any staff or negotiate with any staff in an old age home because they do not belong to the department um, we don't pay their salaries we don't sign their contracts um, this has been proven in a, quite a few CCMA cases where we as a department were cited in a CCMA case about employees being unhappy and where the CCMA basically realized but the department or government is not the employee or employer. Um, I, I think I need to start that because that's one fundamental thing that a lot of people are not aware of, that people think that because the department partially subsidize that we're the employer as well of any kind of issue. Saying that, um, when there is issues, we will always engage the board. We will engage the management. When we do monitoring and evaluation, site visits, um, our staff, and we've got a few M&E officers and social workers that do go and visit the old age homes. We do engage the, the clients as well inside, the residents. So if there's an older person inside, because it's part of the monitoring to see if they're okay with the food, do they get the good service? So we check from all kinds of angles. If an old age home or any older person's facility is not compliant with the act, we will not close them down. We are, our approach is very developmental in approach. So we will try and see how we can assist them for easily up to two years. Some of them, I, I've been involved with in, Ms. Fortein even longer than me. I've been involved with old age homes since 2005 um, in this department. Ms. Fortein, you've been when? <laughs> 20 years already. So in those 20 years and even my 15 years, I can count on one hand where we've actually forced a place to close down. Otherwise, we don't. We rather get another another organization to take over um, or we negotiate with the board to have mentoring like uh, Dr. Lois being given as organization. Um, so there's various kinds of things that we look at just before we close a place down. We have had two old age homes that closed down last year, but they decided to close down. We didn't close them. So that's another thing that I need to alert, um, that when, when an organization has come to us and say, listen, we need more money, we can't financially support. Do you know how terrible it is for us as a department to say, we know you're struggling financially, but I don't have money to give you. Our budgets have been cut. Where must I now get this money from? We have pitched this for this past three, four years to Treasury um, about the situation of old age homes and the older person sector. Unfortunately, they have not given us additional funding. Um, so it is something that's that's very difficult and I need to emphasize that. Um, I think if I just want to look at specific cases that was mentioned, Honorable Member, I'm not sure about Kalicha because we don't have an old age home in Kalicha, um, unless you maybe have the name of the place um, because if a place is unregistered, we will definitely not fund them. Um, it's it's not within our policy. So remember, if it's possible, just to maybe get the name. I, I know there used to be in Langa, but that's not Kalicha. In Langa, there used to be a home that belonged to the city of Cape Town, the property. But that place was never registered as an old age home because our Google led to our Ikaya. Yeah. Okay. In Google Eto, we've got Ikaya, but Ikaya is registered. It is oh. registered, mm. but oh. they were not complying. There was some shortage that they need to do. Okay. Because uh, according to the lady uh -huh. who found them, uh -huh. she was new. She's from KZ and she took over okay. because of the mismanagement of money. Mm. And there were things that mm. they still need to do so that mm. they can get uh, full funding. Mm. 
But mm. at that moment, they set the department to 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 to, to fund them because mm -hmm. there is a lot of need. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's big need. So if it's organisation that we funding, then we will be be monitoring them quite closely on various kinds of issues. I don't know. We will hear please. We will back up our We have to listen to all the responses. You are more than welcome to take Mr. Jordan out for a coffee and have a nice discussion. OK, thank you very much. Then the one on specifically, um, remember, was it Mariesburg or Marysburg? The yeah. Marysburg is a typo in the documentation. It refers to Mariesburg. Okay. It's definitely Marysburg. Okay, because yeah. now because there was an issue in Mariesburg, Old Age Home as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've read the word Mariesburg. Okay. 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 So with regards to, and I'm going to allude to Mariesburg as well because there's also Old Age Home with the same kind of issues. Yes, the boards. Uh, if you look at some of the older terms, the boards are predominantly white. That That is a fact. I think that's a thing that a lot of people ask about transformation and so forth. Now, once again, as a department, we do have that statistics and we have seen it through to you with your last um, request from the standing committee of um, all the, the, the lists of transformation and, and race and so forth. Um, as I've said, we don't appoint the boards. The community chooses them. So if there is an issue with a board being too white, then it is because of who have elected them um, and which the department can't base because we're not a part of the election process. We're not allowed to be a part of the election process. If there's other transformation issues, then it must be raised to us specifically so that we can engage the board and say, listen, there is various con complaints from the community that transformation is not taking place. So we always play as a facilitator. Um, so if there's something specifically with Murraysburg, and I think specifically, if I recall correctly, the board is predominantly white, if I recall correctly. No, uh, I think you must speak to the minister, ne? because mm. she even mm. went there. Yeah. We, we spoke about it. I shame she went there. I don't know what happened because they, in course, I was going to say the lady is Noma Amle. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. She does as she, 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 she wants. It's like she owns the people. No, the, the problem. Mem Member Fry. The problem, Mem Mem the, Member the Fry, white... I think you made the wrong decision. We should have elected Member Paco Paco Post as the chair. <laughs> She's definitely in the spirit. Uh, members, I don't want us to go into a dialogue about this specific um, old age home. I note on the, the last item on our agenda, on the 26th to the 30th of June 2023, this committee has proposed to go and visit either the Marysburg or the Mariasburg old age home, depending on the typo here. But it looks like it's Toast River, Marys, Marysburg, Beaufort West, and Oatswell, and Canalan. So I think we can engage on that specific old age home during that visit. No, no, we will come with community. We'll come with community safety and with the department. Chairperson. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm Yes, Member Van Fuegel. The sound is very bad. We can't hardly hear you. Because remember, Baku Baku Force has not put on her mic. Um, she's busy sub chairing the meeting as well. There's a, a two way conversation. But we have now called Member Baku Baku Force to order. She has agreed to take uh, Mr. Jordan out for a cappuccino to, to um, you vent are some out of these of issues. Order, member. You are. So we're going to hand over back to Mr. Jordan and just make, if we can just make sure that your microphone is switched on. No, thank you, Chair. Um, I think then there's also the issue of rest of old age home. Now, 
and my team is here to confirm this. Um, if you look at the one sad situation of the position of old age homes in South Africa is that most of those old age homes have been built 50 years ago because of apartheid. That's where it started. Um, so that's why you would find that a lot of the old age homes predominantly still in predominantly old white areas. Um, but saying that, there is a lot of old age homes that's been built 50, 60 years ago. So what's the issue? Maintenance. It's old buildings. It's starting to fall apart. Um, it is a concern. We have noticed it. But as a department, we cannot give them funding because we don't have that funding to upgrade. Point one. Point two, I'm also not allowed to give them funding if it belongs to them. It's their property. The only time when government can get involved with upgrade of buildings, if it's public works as buildings. So if I look all correctly, Debbie, what was that a building of public works, the current risk of? No, it's not. OK, Ms. Fortain no. will just add on. It's, it's their uh, specific building. The building belongs to the board, to yeah. that organization. OK, thanks. So that's not a government building, so it's very difficult for us to upgrade. The second thing is I've heard about this property, JJ LaRue or something. Now, as far as I know, it's not to relocate. It's to expand their current place. That's what we were made to believe. It's not for them to move the whole old age home to the new premises. It was for them to expand it. We can be corrected, but that's the that's the information we got from the old age home. Um, that is also a situation, and I think there was a parliamentary question, um, specifically about the old age home. Um, now, Public Works is the one facilitating the property. A note was identified apparently for DSD for office space. What has happened, HOD offer that I don't know because I'm not involved with the office space allocation of this department. So I think what should happen is that public works should be approached to say, listen, DSD, are you still going to use this building or not? If DSD is not going to use this building for office space, then public works can consider to lease that building out to rest of old age home. So it, it, there is a possibility if DSD is no longer involved. And I'm looking at the actually if I'm not part of DSD, but actually I am. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not part of the infrastructure of buildings for our own staff. Uh, it's not in my portfolio. Um, so that's the issue on Ristorf. Um Is there anything else I've missed out, Patiswa and Debbie? Any questions that I've missed out? Okay. Okay, just a thing on the NPCs. As a department, we fund NPOs, NPCs and trusts. That's the three entities we fund. So if you're an NPC or if you're an NGO or if you're both, we will fund you. That's that's not a problem. That is, is within the department's policy. The latest legislation that we've seen coming up now on NPCs, if there's an NPC, there must also be an NGO at least within that organization. So Arvindris should have actually then an NPC plus an NGO at the same time. That seems it's another requirement of new act, but as well. Thanks, Charles. Yes, it's, a, it's an update that we received with the amendment of the NPO Act, that it's no longer voluntary to register as an NPO if you are in the humanitarian field where the Department of Social Development is involved. It's, it's now compulsory, whether you are registered as a trust or what, but you need to, it's it will be now be compulsory for all N organizations to register as NPOs, mm. yes, if they are working in the field of social development. Thanks. Thank you. And then just the last thing maybe to say on Arvind Rist, because I see that was a contentious issue this morning. There has been lots of investigations against the old age home. Uh, we've received a forensic report. We have engaged the board. My team have sat and talked to them and engaged them. Um, I'm very concerned about the board's approach to the district department, the negative approach towards the department. Um, we are seriously considering to give this over now to legal services. Um, I just need to put that because this is a transparent process. It's an open process. I cannot hide these kinds of things, but we are struggling as a department. Um, Patiswa as director and Ms. Fortain sat in how many meetings? We were threatened at one stage with lawyers from their side as well. Um, so we're at the stage where we will hand us over to our legal services, but we will try one last administrative justice process to inform them that we've requested them to respond to us in writing, which they have not done this past three, four weeks. 
their last email we will send today. If they're not, then we're handing it over to legal services. Thanks. Thank you um, very much. So we have a report on our visit to Aventris. What I'm going to ask in our resolutions, if we can then also just ask the department to give us a separate briefing, and perhaps we need to arrange a follow-up visit to that specific um, uh, facility, and then also um, have the representatives from the union, because I've got, I'm just looking at a letter that was sent to the committee as an one of the outcomes of our last engagements, we asked the we asked Mr. Harun to send a formal letter to the committee. So what we will do is we'll schedule a separate meeting to discuss that specific old age home. Um, but we'll also get a briefing on in terms of what the department's processes will be going forward, etc. Um, and perhaps um, that can happen in the Worcester community so that there's some engagement with the other stakeholders as well and not something that happens here um, in, in Wales Street. Um, on the rest of um, old age home, um, I think the facility does belong to the department and the current usage of the JJ May, the, the, May, the old clinic, is currently used as a storage facility for the Department of Social Development Sanitary Dignity uh, PAD program. Uh, we went there. Um, it was a very confusing process when I was the chair. We kept on asking what the plans were for that facility. And between Public Works and the Department of Health, they played ping pong with us, uh, sending us different letters um, saying that it's not our facility, it's Public Works, and we don't have any plans. And then eventually when we got there, we realized social development was already in the facility. So what we will do as well, we'll, we'll do a follow-up visit to that facility because the, the crux of what Member Philander was saying and what we saw when we were there is that the older persons are actually in a very dangerous situation. Um, the community is the problem where they're situated. Um, they also cannot cope with the current facilities that they have, and they're not able to offer the type of services that they should because of the constraints within the current facility. So we will note that for a, a follow up as well. And then on member Baku Baku Forces, um, uh, with the Murraysburg issue, we, we've got that on our agenda as well. Um, Members, with that, I want to say thank you to the Amen. department. My Member, hand is up, Chair. Yes, Member Van Vogel? Thanks, Chair. My hand is up. I'm not sure. Perhaps you must that. Because I don't, uh, I don't have a computer in front of me. Sorry, we're not in the chambers. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it's fine. Chair, Chair, the department didn't touch on my issue of racism. It's, it's alive in rural areas. So what are they doing as a department? Uh, 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 to really try to 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 deal with the racism issue in 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 the in the in the in these facilities, uh, 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 um, because it's alive. Okay. Uh, black and coloured people are treated differently. So 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 as the department, and I think the minister is also aware of that uh, uh, of that issue. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Before I hand over to the HOD member Brankes. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair yes, uh, on the response from the department on the, the, the forensic uh, report that was uh, that's in the position of the department at the moment. Um, just one or two questions: uh, For how long do, does the, the department have that report, that forensic report, and uh, is it possible for the department to make it available also to us as members? Uh, Chair, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, via the chair. Um, remember, we received it in February this year. Um, it has taken quite a few months, that forensic investigation. So that is without our control. It's not our department that does that. We send it to the Premier's department's got a forensic unit. So it's totally independent away from the department. So I think that's probably why it took so long, because they also went to go and do all of those investigations themselves. Um, so yes, um, we got it this year only, uh, February month. Um, I think it was concluded the 23rd of January, if I recall correctly, but we received about only from the 1st of Feb. Then we start engaging the older chamber, but yes, uh, if if the committee would require the report, we can provide it to the committee. We can. Thank you. Then I'll hand over to the HOD to answer Member Van Vogel. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, I think the, the department deals with racism and any other complaints like uh, of uh, discrimination uh, and abuse uh, uh, when they are reported to us. So, so if facilities uh, have incidents like this and then, then we do ask them to report this to us so that we can intervene depending on the situation. 
um, we we have a, a mandate to ensure that the old age homes are conducive to the older persons, that there's no elder abuse. And obviously where we fund them, we also make sure that we uh, to, that the homes are compliant with all the financial requirements. And then, uh, you know, we have our, our powers in terms of our registration process as well, where we can we can deal with uh, any non-compliance with the registra registration requirements. So we do have some powers over these things, and we can intervene on the if if we uh, if the issue touches on any area we have power to to intervene in. Uh, but if there is a particular race racist incidents that occur uh, that are beyond our power to address, uh, then the Human Rights Commission would would be the the appropriate body with the powers to investigate and intervene. So it really depends on the nature of the issue. Um, and and we do rely on the homes to report these things to us so that we can take it up uh, and address it accordingly. Um, so uh, so I think in in response to the honourable member's question, um, we we take all forms of uh, of uh, abuse of elderly persons seriously, and we intervene to the extent that we can. And then obviously, uh, when it's beyond our powers, uh, then we we turn to to other institutions to to assist uh, to take it further as required um, but i think also uh, you, we we do we do generally uh, find we can resolve uh, most issues when they are reported to us uh, quite effectively but then you do get some some things that we have to go further we have to go to court etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, like we we you know we have in the past uh, had to deal with um, particularly with this conflict within uh, the uh, the board uh, and this, these things sometimes do end up in court as well. So it really depends on the nature of the issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much and thank you once again to the department for making themselves available this morning and for answering questions. We will certainly be in touch in terms of the next steps um, in addressing some of those issues specifically around um, Aventress and uh, Ristoff as well. And thank you very much to the members of the public for making time to engage with us this morning as well. Um, you, this committee is, is always open and we like interaction and we actually need to make sure that um, more people join these meetings, even if it's just online. Members, if you can indulge me for a minute as well, or if Namonde allows, um, we are just going to adopt two sets of minutes. The minutes for Tuesday, the 28th of February, a meeting that was held at uh, nine o'clock. And that was the briefing by the Department of Social Development on the quarterly report for the period April uh, to June 2022, July to September 2022, and October to December 2022. I'm now tabling those minutes. Um, if you could please just check for accuracy and um, correctness on page one. Uh, page two. Uh, the department is more than welcome to leave as well. There is some um, refreshments in the members' lounge on the sixth floor, so please do eat. Uh, members of, um, you are more than welcome to stay for this little bit. It won't take too long, or you can go upstairs um, to uh, have some refreshments, and then the members will join you um, right after we've done the, the minutes, and you can lobby them a little bit more there. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chairperson. Yes. <laughs> Members, so page one. I'm now tabling page two. Are there are any corrections? There's a hand online. Member Van Fogho, do you have a correction on page two? No hand. No, we'll Okay, no, no. Okay, then page three. And then page four deals with the um, requests for information and the resolutions. One of those resolutions being that a visit will be undertaken to the Lindelani Youth Care Center. So that needs to be added to the committee's program. Members, may I please have a proposer and a seconder for the minutes? Member Fry? I propose the minutes, Chair. Mitch, member Bakabakafors? I'm seconding, Chair. Thank you very much. Those minutes of the 28th of February are duly then adopted. 
We now move on to the minutes of our meeting on the 17th of March, two o'clock in the chambers, where we deliberated on vote seven, social development in the schedule to the Western Cape Appropriation Bill. That was our budget discussion. Um, I'm now tabling page one, which deals with attendance as well as the overview from the minister. Page two. And then page three, which deals with public input during that meeting, where we had Mr. Leslie Andrew Sylvester from the Hedefeld Health Committee. And page three also deals with the committee resolutions. Members, may I please have a proposer and a seconder for the minutes? Chair, yeah, propose the minutes. Proposed by Member Fry, seconded by Member. I second it, Chair. Thank you very much. Seconded by Member Baku Baku Force. The minutes of the 17th of March is then duly adopted. Members, you also have a copy of the um, committee draft program. Um, can I ask that you go through this and have a discussion and see whether you're happy with it as is? Um, Namonde will just make the change to the Marisburg visit, as well as add the visit to the Lendelani um, Youth um, place, of place of Safety. Uh, we just need to add it in. It's not in here at the moment. So it was a, it was a resolution from the previous meeting. And then just my input on that, I'm going to ask if we could m the um, we've got scheduled in July a briefing by children's organizations on the issues facing children. I'm going to ask the chairperson through Namonde if this can be pushed up to an earlier date because we've been doing this since 2019. This was something we resolved in, in 2019. We were supposed to have the children's commissioner and if you remember during the, the interviews for the children's commissioner, we had Molo Songo Lolo asking us to involve children. We said we're going to invite them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to suggest that we look at moving that up to Monday okay. um, to, to make sure that we get an update from the Children's Commissioner and then invite um, children's organizations as well as children to participate in that meeting. And perhaps um, also ask that we invite the junior city councils from the different provinces, different um, uh, towns to also engage with us. And maybe then ask the, the um, the office of the speaker to be part of that as well and public education and outreach to talk about how do we engage young people in in the processes of parliament because that was one of the issues there so i see we've got a briefing by social development on the funding of old age homes but maybe we can move some of it together we should have actually had that briefing today because <laughs> we had members of the public yeah um members are there any other points or inputs that you'd like to make Meeting now with the way you want to involve the junior must be during the office hours because remember it's always the issue of bringing children. We can make it in the afternoon. We can swap with education. After school, we can maybe even do a joint meeting with social development with the education as well. We do it at one of the schools. Maybe um, Brankas. Uh, yes, yes, thanks. Uh, chair, uh, the, the moment uh, the department makes the uh, forensic uh, uh, the report available. Can it be circulated amongst the, the yes. members? Yes. We have to write to them first to ask them to aye, send it. Aye, aye, I aye. promise you they're not going to send it just like that. They, they will they <laughs> already. I, I'm Manuela. <laughs> Don't remember. No, no, but we'll write to them and then they'll send it. Members, um, with that, thank you very much for your time. The meeting is thus adjourned. Please go and help yourselves to some refreshments upstairs. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye, members online. Enjoy your tea and coffee.